I'm going to talk about Hackerball, which is a computer you can throw, if you wish, <coughs> or if you like, it's a ball that you can program. Uh, we took it to Kickstarter in the spring, and it was very successful. Um, I'll say a little bit about that later, but I really wanted to talk about why we did it and some of the ideas behind Hackerball. Uh, because Hackerball started off, had absolutely nothing to do with education. Uh, it was an intern project, an experiment uh, by uh, a young industrial designer and a software developer made by many. Uh, a three-month project over summer. We gave them a really simple brief, which was identify opportunities in areas that interest both of you, but also work on a connected product. We do side projects at Made by Money. We're a consultancy. We're not a, a starter. We do side projects to find out about new technologies and uh, make ourselves more useful to our clients. We've been doing quite a bit of work with Adidas looking at some problems they were having with uh, their design process and development process with connected products. And it seemed like an area that we didn't know enough about and wanted to learn more in. So Ben and Tom went for kids and play. Hackable is really about play. It's not about education as such. And so what they came up with was a, a concept called rule ball. And I'll just read it out because it explains really what hackable is. You play with the rule ball by passing it between a group of friends with the color of the ball dictating how it should be passed. Use a phone to tailor the rules of the game. So hackable is really just a little communication device that has some knowledge in it and some rules in it that enables you to do effectively generative play. They then went out and created a prototype using a 3D printer that we won in a hack day at the Guardian. I've lost it, so it doesn't matter. You can chuck it around, it's fine. Right, bang. If I do that with, <coughs> it's fine. If you do that with developers, they get really freaked out. They think of computers as being very fragile, incredibly expensive and important things, and you're not to throw them around. And again, one of the things we've been playing with throughout developing Hackable is the, aesthet the aesthetics of computing and started to try to turn them on their head. Um, <clears throat> they built a prototype. Uh, it was a really quite ugly thing, uh, but started testing it with kids, and it just felt like a really, really good idea. When they finished their internship, Ben stayed with us, Tom left, and over the next six months, we started to think about maybe there's a product idea here. And it was taken on by four or five people at Made by Many, as, and it became really the side project that just wouldn't die and wouldn't lay over. And it was partly because we wanted to particularly start to understand the development cycles and the prototyping cycles of learning, making, testing of software and electronics and firmware and, case, and, and the hardware casing, the industrial design. It's a very tricky thing to do. You can't software is really quick and dirty and easy. Electronics, you can breadboard and mess about with Arduino, so it's really changing. What made the big difference for us was Arduino. Uh, then firmware creates new complications as well as new opportunities because if you change the electronics, you've got to then start changing the firmware. And also the casing introduces interesting complications around things like battery and how you charge it and how you undo it and put it back together again. Uh, so that's that was some of the hardware prototyping that was done. The software prototyping, the way we work is as quick and dirty as it possibly can be. So this is prototyping with software with phone core. So it's a bunch of kids, they're making a game with some simple instructions on a great big model of an iPhone. And eventually, back and forth, back and forth. And we learned a huge amount about how they think and how they play from doing this. With lots of rounds of testing. And ultimately, we made our first working prototype, uh, which we got made in a factory in China. In fact, it's a factory we're still working with now. Uh, it's got a... Uh, <coughs> Hackable has a, a sensor in it, an accelerometer. Uh, it knows different aspects of how it's been thrown, how it, whether it's falling, whether it's rising, whether it's still. 
and then plays that back in terms of vibration or sound files or RGB lights and different colors and different patterns of lighting. Uh, the games, this is the, the first simple app we made uh, which enabled children to program their own games. And you can see that children have done it. So things like red is truth and blue is dare, green is you have to kiss someone, purple you have to dance <laughs> till your next turn. <laughs> and I'll just try another one. It is basically pie face. You have to throw the ball to someone's face, lull, and the person who gets hit says splat. <laughs> um, so no adult would ever come up with anything like that. And that's the principle behind Hackerball. It's about playing and allowing children to play by themselves without the interference of adults who are trying to teach them. Uh, it's about inventing games and programming and playing and improving. And this was quite an interesting learning for us in terms of we thought of Hackerball as a toy, which it is, in a way, or as a game. Uh, kids think it's awesome and interesting and funny. They, made, they, they were given lots of words, including rude ones, they could say about the product when they were doing a test. Uh, but it was, uh, in terms of going to market, we thought uh, about toy manufacturers, about what kind of uh, partnerships we could do with them. And we found out quickly that this actually was not going to work for Hackable because toys are very seasonal. Uh, the margins that were demanded are huge. It didn't feel right in any way. So it's not so much a toy or a game, but is it something that's potentially more about learning and educational? This is some more testing we did with the working prototype. They're wearing school uniform. It's, it's after school. We've done quite a bit of testing in schools as well. So if you play Keepy Up and you with Hackable, it actually records how many times you've thrown it up on the phone app. And what they're doing, we discover, is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is they make up a system with some rules in it, and, <coughs> and then they play it, and then they find out what works and what doesn't, and they go back and they change it until it does work. And it's very like, this is a key stage one requirement. These are key stage, key stage two requirements. And it felt like Hackable had some real possibilities in education. The danger, of course, is that children are acutely sensitive to any kind of hint of learning or teaching and, and obstinately resistant to it as well. And we did not want to make a learning product. Uh, but we did have ideas around conditional logic and step-by-step -step procedures and sensor controls and game design, which actually played to those things really well and had the potential to help teachers start to teach those quite difficult things to very young children of between 6 and 10, which is what Hackable is aimed at. So maybe it's an education product, but please, please not like that with a very finite number of things you can do to it and not like those which say learning everywhere and are actually targeted at adults rather than children. And if you go to Hamleys or the Science Museum or any shop like that, there's lots of products with very severe, quite fashionable, modernist packaging which never, ever move off the shelves because kids like things that are much, much more orange, pink and purple and really blast out their, their ideas to you. Uh, something maybe a bit more like that, which is a Ken Garland product for Galt made in the 60s, something that has endless possibilities and is actually really bright and interesting. So when we went to the next phase of Hackable, which is let's actually think about a Kickstarter because that's one way to get a product to market or at least do a very good market test without spending much money. And think about the whole range, not just the object itself, but also how the app works, how the packaging works as a system of, if you like, a, a graphic system uh, and an aesthetic system, which in this case speaks pretty much to, to space. Uh, something that talks to girls and boys and something that says something about discovery. The, uh, the app is very much the same, and, and also start to think about the sounds and how they work. And bringing Hackable to life. And they fart noises, which are, of course, essential and very, very popular. Um, 
So we couldn't do all that by ourselves. We're principally a strategy designer, software company. We needed skills that we didn't have, including electronics design, uh, including sound design, and, and also uh, an industrial design company who've been absolutely brilliant, MAP, who also did the packaging and exterior for, for the Kano computer. Um, and they've been such a fantastic partner because their interests are exactly the same as ours. They want to learn. And so it's worked as a, as a very, very close relationship. And so starting to think about the object, uh, creating something that is actually a, a quite mature prototype for a Kickstarter. And we're currently going through a process of turning that into something that's more robust, doesn't fall to pieces when you throw it too hard against a wall. Um, and, uh, but also has all of the qualities that we're looking for in terms of light and sound. So we now start to think of Hackable almost as a platform rather than a product, because that computer with its, uh, with its LEDs and its sensors that sits in the middle of the ball could be in any kind of object. It doesn't have to be a ball. Hackable is much more a little communication tool that, as I say, embodies some rules. Uh, it is a computer that you can throw. So we went to Kickstarter. I've got three minutes, 47 seconds left. I'm <laughs> counted down by the second. I think I'll do it easily in the um, We learned First thing we learned is never launch Kickstarter at exactly the same hour as the Pebble watch. It's <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kickstarter comes down when you do that. So all your best laid plans get dashed. Fortunately, we managed to completely buck the Kickstarter trend by having a peak in the middle of the campaign rather than at the beginning. Uh, which was as a result of some very hard work and great support from Kickstarter itself. Uh, we raised $241,000, which sounds like a lot of money. It's actually going to be, it, we, it's just enough for us to deliver our first 3,000 balls. We're working now on the design of software, redoing the casing with a new design, and we'll go into manufacture sometime in the early autumn. And we should be able to deliver the product just before Christmas, maybe just, hopefully. <laughs> um, but Kickstarter is not just about making money. You learn a huge amount by doing a Kickstarter. It's very tough. It's hard work. It takes a lot of good preparation. But what we learned, first of all, was how to talk about Hackable and explain to people what it was. Uh, who would buy it, which was middle-class parents with children who were around about 30 to 35 years old, and their children were between 6 and 10. I mean, it sounds obvious, but actually it's very important to learn that. And also they would buy multiples for their children's schools. So we sold lots of fives and threes and fours. Uh, how much they might pay? Well, we, knew how, we certainly knew that they were prepared to buy it at $69. We tested the bottom. We haven't quite tested the top yet, but if anyone wants a Hackable to pre-order, it's £75 online at hackable.com now. Um, we got lots of very interesting invitations to partner as a result of the Kickstarter. Uh, and also found out what the press would say, which was mostly really, really good stuff. Although it was on the Gadget Show, a terrible program. There used to be a client of ours once upon a time, about a month ago, and that Dragon's Den bloke, I can't remember his name, Theo, said it was absolutely terrible, not recognising it was a prototype he was dealing with and not a finished product. But, so never put your stuff onto Gadget Show without control. Um, so what the, lastly, I think just in terms of what Hackable is, I think it's... We can say what it's not. It's not just a computer. It's not just a ball. It's not a construction kit. It's not a robot because it's not about controlling where it goes like Sparrow. It's much more about using it as almost a totem uh, that does things. And it's quite interestingly dumb too. So it's very, it doesn't have letters. It doesn't speak words, although it could do. And I'm very interested in the day when a hack, one hacker ball can recognize other hacker balls and you can get a whole network of them talking to each other and responding to each other. Because I think then it will start to get really, really interesting as a product and as an educational tool. So that's hacker ball. It sits somewhere between three quite interesting areas, including an active lifestyle, because you play with hacker ball outside as well as inside. It's not sitting behind a screen. You also do it with your friends. It's not doing it alone. It's about generative play in that it can do an infinite number of things. Sorry. And it, to some degree, promotes technology literacy. How much, we're not quite sure yet, and we don't want to make a huge amount of claims for that. So with just 22 seconds left, it's 
taken three years to do that. It's not simple, especially if you're an agency. Agencies are make really, really bad clients, and we're a very terrible client of ourselves because sometimes the management team just completely forgets about Hackable and walks away with lots of decisions unmade. Um, but in the end, the only thing to remember is never trust a computer that you can't throw out of a window. Thank you very much.